Oh, thank you so much, everyone. What a, a great start to, to the evening. Um, before I get into the talk, I'm actually going to just sort of try and sort of detox us a bit um, before we get going. Uh, anyone feeling a little tired from the season? Do you, it's a year since lockdown kicked off, if you were in that first group of lockdown people. Uh, it's been a flipping hard week, hasn't it, for many people? Um, beginning with all sorts of things and just last night stuff, horrible. Uh, so I wonder if we might maybe stand uh, together, um, not in a particularly spiritual way, but just to sort of, you know, loosen your shoulders and sort of shake it down a bit and just go, ah. anyone want to go? Ah? It's a perfectly legitimate response in church sometimes is to go, ah. There's a theological word for it, but I've forgotten it. Um, <laughs> I think it's lament. That's the one. <laughs> lament. Nicola was talking about it the other week. It's lament. It's like, oh, it was horrible, wasn't it? I mean, just horrible. Some of the stuff going on in the world, and that's before you even remember what's going on in in South Sudan or you know all around the world where atrocities are, are happening on such a regular basis. And, uh, and Lord, we just pray that this evening that you will come and meet with us. Uh, we. They're so in need of you, Lord God, so in need of you, Lord Jesus. It can feel like we're orphans here on earth at times. And I thank you that this passage teaches into those feelings that we have. And I pray that tonight that you'll renew our strength, our faith, our hope, and our love for you. And that we'll have a lot of fun here in the building together. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We'll sit if you want, lie if you want, walk around if you want. Um, we're in uh, John chapter 14. And we're looking at Jesus saying, I'm going to send you another comforter, um, which is, is not the best language because for me, a comforter is one of those blankets that children wrap around themselves or something they stick in their mouth. It, it, it's sort of an older English word. Comfort means with strength, come, fought, fought, strength. I uh, see so the Holy Spirit is the advocate, the strengthener, the encourager. He is an advocate in the sense of like a legal person. He's on your side. So have you ever had that sort of conversation in your head, like, I'm rubbish, I'm useless? You know, they, we, when I was growing up, it was the, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I'm going out to long ones, thin ones, short ones, fat ones, see them. Something about squirming. Anyway, anyway that, I mean, that was a cultural moment for me, but clearly lost on 90% of the room. Uh, but do you know that, that feeling? Like, oh. We, we don't know where I am. It's, it's almost like a lament. It's like, is it just me? Is it just me? And I, I was doing some research on Mother's Day or on Google this week, and I realized that every group of people I could think of were somehow offended by Mother's Day, <laughs> including new mothers. It was like almost everyone had some reason to hate Mother's Day. <laughs> if you're a father trying to get Mother's Day right at home, it's pretty tough, I have to say. If, if you're, you know, every reason to be miserable. The person who invented Mother's Day has since repented of it. She's like, oh, I didn't mean it to go like this. It's horrible. But you can see the reason that we, we try and do these celebratory days. And yet, because we're all so tied up emotionally, we can end up feeling orphan spirit. We're like, oh, is it just me? Is it just me? And uh, of course, it's not just us. It's just that's the lie that comes in. And that's why we've got this advocate who comes and whispers in the ear. And, and the advocate does the opposite of the serpent. Remember how the serpent whispered in the Garden of Eden? Did God really say? So he didn't say in a nasty voice, he was a winsome. Did God really say? Or to Jesus, you know, go on, go for glory. Jump off the temple. Doesn't matter. Quoting scripture even at you. And the advocate comes and whispers truth to you. He's the spirit of truth in this passage. It comes out three times in John's Gospel. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He brings truth to you. And what does truth do? It sets you free. It's just hard to believe, isn't it? That's the problem. <laughs> you know, uh, do you know that Lauren Daigle song, You Say? It's like one of the biggest sort of Christian international hits. Uh, and it's, you, you know, you say I'm strong when I feel that I'm weak and, and all this sort of thing. And, and that's what the advocate comes and says. That's what the spirit says. He says, you're strong. But, the trick to getting to know the Holy Spirit isn't actually your own strength at all. Romans 8 tells us the Spirit helps us in our, any guesses? In our weakness, yeah. He helps us in our weakness. It's one of the most glorious things about Christianity that it's not for the religiously superior people. 
It's basically for screw-ups, for failures. And so there's a sort of a, a good side to the orphan spirit. It might mean you're close to breakthrough in your spiritual life. You're, you're feeling like you know, nobody likes me, everybody hates me. <laughs> Why is it just me? You're not far off what Jesus described as being poor in spirit. And they're the people who get the kingdom of, of heaven, the kingdom of God. If you're in that place, you're like, oh, then maybe there's room for the Holy Spirit to come in. I don't know if you have a personal story of encounter with the Holy Spirit. There's, there's an evangelist called Louis Palau, very, very famous. He died this last week. Matt Redman was converted at one of his, uh, one of his concerts, gigs, uh, preachers. Uh, lots of people converted in his ministry. He had this, this great saying, which I'm going to get slightly wrong, but he basically said something like, it doesn't matter if your story of you and Jesus or you and the Spirit is fantastic or wonderful or brilliant or exciting. What matters is that it's yours. It doesn't matter if your story is exciting. What matters is it's yours. In other words, have you got a personal story of how the Spirit of God has immersed you baptized you, immersed you in God. It might have happened very gradually, not quite while you were sleeping, but you know, while you were waiting. It might have happened in a, in a crisis moment. It may be that actually you're one of those rare people who's actually walked fairly faithfully with God throughout your whole life. And he's never really been absent from you. There are many gorgeous people like that in the scripture. John the Baptist was one of them. You just walk with God from infancy through. So did Jesus walk with God? And so maybe that your personal story is actually, I've got to know him better over time. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. And it may be though that if you're like me, you had moments of encounter with the Spirit of God. And then two other things crept in on you. And they're, they're things that come out in this passage. And Jesus says in this passage, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. And the Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with, with him. If he does not love me, he will not obey my teaching. So one, one of the prerequisites to having an ongoing, life-giving relationship with the Spirit is obedience to Jesus. And, uh, and that's a bit harder to do, isn't it, in life? Because Jesus asks some quite challenging things of us. In fact, he spells out his own obedience in this passage uh, and it's, it's, it's as tough as it gets. His own obedience um, it comes in verses 28 uh, through 30. You've heard me saying, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I've told you what will happen, so that when it does happen, you'll believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of the world is coming. He ha that means the devil's coming to get him, to crucify him. It's, it's a week before his uh, crucifixion murder. He, but the devil has no hold on me. The prince of this world has no hold on me. But the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me to do. So obedience for Jesus meant death on a cross. Why? Because of his love for the Father and to release us from our sins and our disobediences. So obeying Jesus' commands is not, it's not a light thing. It's not a trivial thing. It's not just have you tithed your money this month. It's not just, have you kept Sabbath? It's not just, have you honored your, your mother or father if you're lucky enough to have relationships with them, enough to send cards to them on a, on a particular day of the year? It's, are you prepared to surrender yourself, to die to yourself like Jesus did on the cross so that he, he can be Lord? So obedience is the first thing if we want more of the Spirit, and it comes from a place of love, not of fear, not of trying to prove that we're all right with God, but if we love him, we will obey his commands. Do you, do you, do you know the difference between that? Can you, can you think of it in relationships that, that you're in or that you've grown up in? There, there are some people, say a teacher at school, who you just really liked, yeah? I mean, everyone lucky enough to have one teacher at least that they liked? Anyone here? A there are a few teachers around, aren't there? Uh, one teacher you liked. And, and for that teacher, what would you have done to get in their favor. It's, it's often quite a lot, isn't it? I can remember teachers who meant a huge amount to me. I can remember one who caught me just after I'd, uh, I'd finished my uh, GCSEs, and he was like, oh, you will do geography at university, won't you? <laughs> I ended up doing geography for a year at university. Why? I really respected Dr. Laverick. He was a wonderful guy, 
I, really, I was a fairly malleable person. I didn't really have much idea what I wanted to do. And for him, I basically changed the course of my life, at least for a year before dropping out of the subject and doing theology. <laughs> it's amazing what we'll do for someone that, that we love, we respect, we honor. We'll do all sorts of things for people we fear as well, won't we? Uh, yeah. And that's, that's not from a great place. And God's not looking for our fear. He's looking for our love, which then draws us into amazing, willing obedience. He has got legions of angels who will be perfectly obedient to him all the time. Jesus, even in Gethsemane, said, don't you know, I could command, I can't remember how many he said, how many was it? Tens of thousands of angels to come and deliver me now. I can just do it. So he's got people who will obey him perfectly, and they're pretty amazing beings. But he's looking for a love response from you. And it's the thing that pleases heaven almost more than anything. And he backs that love response by giving you the Holy Spirit. And you see, the Holy Spirit in, in the Bible is often described as a dove, a turtle dove. And I don't know much about birds. I can spot which one's a robin and which one's a magpie in the garden. Uh, but what I understand about these turtle doves is that they're the easiest startled birds. Uh, and so if one uh, is sort of coming near to you or it's resting and there's a loud noise, it will just fly away. R.T. Kendall tells a great story about one in his book, Sensitivity of the Spirit. He, he's saying he's... Um, he was getting ready to go and preach in church one day and he was having a right argument with his wife as sometimes happens in vicarages and, and so forth. And, and there was a dove on the roof and as they started to raise their voices at each other, this is, you know, lovely R.T. Kendall who's preached here a couple of times. As they started to raise their voices at each other, uh, the bird just flew away. And he, he felt it was a sign from God that the spirit could easily just fly away from us as well. <laughs> He's easily disturbed. He comes in peace to peaceful people, for people who love God, who want to obey his commandments. And then he felt the spirit whisper in his ear, and he said, and he said, well, God, God, I'm going to church now. Um, and it, well, the spirit said, well, you can go if you want, Artie, but I'm going to stay here with your wife <laughs> and minister to her. I um, guess he'd read the, uh, the agenda for the week. You see, the Holy Spirit, you need to know two things, really, about the Holy Spirit from Scripture. One is that if you can say that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, you have the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's, that's just entry-level fantastic. In Ephesians 2, the uh, Holy Spirit's described as an engagement ring, a seal for you. It's a guarantee. And God's not going to let you down. He's not going to break off the engagement. The, uh, the ring's on a finger. And you've got God forever. That's, it's a guarantee for you. But to walk in step with the Spirit... And to stay immersed in the Spirit is a totally another story. That's much more tricky. We have to keep being people who love God, obey his commands, and walk with him. So that was the first thing that can get in the way. The second thing is the reason that we don't always find ourselves loving God and obeying the commandments. It's because of the world. And it says here, the Spirit of truth is coming to you. The world cannot accept him. It neither sees him nor knows him. Uh, and Judas, not Judas Iscariot, says, Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Uh, and then he talks about the obedience thing. And the thing is, the world, which means, basically, in the Bible, it means anyone doing things their own way. Anyone who's not for Jesus is against Jesus. The, the world can't see the Spirit, and they can't know him. You know him, and you have him in you, Jesus says, or you will have him in you, so you can take the translation both ways. But the world can't have the spirit. And yet the world is quite an attractive thing at times, isn't it? For, for Christians, even Christians who know that experience of being baptized in the spirit and immersed in the spirit, it's easy to get into the orphan spirit mode, even when you've had the Holy Spirit. And go, oh. And instead of going, oh, to God, we sort of go, oh. <laughs> so, the, oh, God, it's hard. We go, oh, that looks fun. I wonder what life would be like if I went this way. If I focused on getting more money, if I focused on more sex, if I focused on more power, if I focused on me. Isn't it 
after all, God loves me, so he wants good things for me, so he just wants me to be happy. So therefore, doesn't God really just want me to have whatever I want? It's so easy, isn't it? And the thing is, half the time, we're lying to ourselves. We don't even spot it. It's only when we're in relationships like we're in in church and small groups and accountability and, and we're reading the scriptures so it can talk back to us that we clock, oh, yeah, no, I really, yeah, why? Why did I want that extra, whatever it is, money or relate? Why, why did I, why was I chasing that? And it's because the world's got a strong pull to it. And the prince of this world, Satan, comes like a, an angel. Did God really say and he makes it ever so attractive. And one of Jesus' 12 disciples, the Judas not mentioned here, loved money so much that he conned himself into thinking it would be a good idea to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver because he didn't like the way Jesus was serving poor people. He had hung out with Jesus face to face for three years and still conned himself. So the world can be this illusory attraction for us. And we can try and hold on to it so much. It's one of the reasons I like Sam's song so much, because it's, it's telling us to fix our eyes onto Jesus, not onto just the stuff here. And obeying God can feel like a right drag. It can feel so hard, can't it? Jesus told a, a parable you might find helpful. He said, look, there's a guy who did a startup company and he employed people in his startup and he said, come on, work for me. And after a number of years, I'm going to give you uh, some shares in the company and you'll get a certain uh, dividend at the end of it. And they go, fantastic, that's brilliant, great job, I'll go and do that. A couple of years later, the owner of the company takes on some more team. And he offers them the same offer, the same dividend and the same, uh, the same shares. Another year later, he gets on more people and says, Come on, you come and work for it. And he offers them the same. And then a year later, it is the same. A month after that, he sells the whole thing. Makes an absolute mint on it. And everyone who's worked for him, whether they've worked for five years or three years or two years or one month, they get the same thing. And why did Jesus tell that sort of story? He told it because he knew that it provokes our hearts. We're like... I've labored so hard for you all these years, God. I've been working hard. I even came to the six o'clock service when Richard couldn't stop talking one Sunday. I've been here for hours and you've just treated me the same way as the other person and I want more favor on my life now. And he's like, oh, can you see your heart? What you really love is the world, not me Sometimes we, we have to get to the point where we're really aware we've got an orphan spirit. Where we have a diagnosis put on us and, and next week we'll look at how the spirit convicts us of, of sin, righteousness and judgment. The, the diagnosis comes on us and just goes, you're not quite in the right place, are you? I've been through that over the last couple of years. I've had you know, some of those times people sometimes call dark nights of the soul. Moments of just real spiritual depression. And you're sort of sitting there going, oh, Oh, this is so hard. This is agony to walk through. It's, it's so difficult. And yet, God will woo you out of those moments when he's taught you enough from them. If you, if you actually, it's practically, if you ever find yourself in a moment where you're like, I just feel dead right now. I'm in a desert place. Really easy diagnostic question. This is, if you're making notes ever, this is one to write down. If I'm in a desert place, why am I in a desert place? Did I put myself there or did God put me there? <laughs> if I put myself there by some deliberate sin or ignoring God or something else, then I need to just get out of the desert as fast as possible. But if God's led me into the desert as he did with Jesus after he'd been filled with the Spirit, to say, God, help me to learn whatever I need to learn so that you can bring me out of this dry place as soon as possible. And when you've done that, when you've been in a place of brokenness and desperation and orphanness where you're like, I'm not even sure... If you're my daddy right now, if you're my mum in heaven, then you're in a place where you can go, please come and fill me. It's a paradox of Christianity that sometimes when you're at your most broken, 
you're at your closest to being whole. Sometimes when you're the most fragile, that you're the, the closest to being strong. Sometimes when you think you've just been shattered in pieces and you can't go on, it's the point where God's likely to bless you. Think of Jacob making his way back into Israel to see his brother. He's been away for 14 plus years. He's got two wives, he's got all this stuff, but he's not sure if he's about to be killed. So he sends everyone ahead of him to con them, to con his brother. And then he ends up wrestling with God through the night and says, I'm not going to let go of you till you bless me. Even with all his success, he still had an orphan spirit. Is my brother going to kill me? And we're complex human beings, aren't we? We're a right mess, generally. Complex human beings. You know, there's a lot of talk in, in Christian terms at the moment that we shouldn't talk about sin anymore. <laughs> because people don't get sin, allegedly. They get shame, and they understand shame, but they don't get sin. But if you've watched the news this week, almost everything has been about how we're all sinners. And how half the population are sinners, for guaranteed for sure, and the other half probably are as well. The culture's been labeling it. We're broken, messed up, sinful people. I'm not sure about that. Look on Twitter. Almost every diagnosis on there is you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. When you know that, when you know that you haven't got a leg to stand on, that's exactly the moment to go, please God, please come and give me strength. Please come and comfort me. 